Okay, good. So we want to talk about um, diffusion flames now. And um, in diffusion, for diffusion flames, uh, we said this earlier, uh, is, is, is different in a way that the fuel and air now, they are um, they're, they're not pre-mixed. Uh, fuel and air come from different sides. Um, we haven't looked at a flame in a while, so let's do this just for, just for fun. Um, I always have this thing on my, on my desk, and uh, once in a while, when I have uh, nothing else to do, I just turn it on <laughs> and get inspired. So, um, now we have the fuel coming through the inner tube, and the fuel by itself cannot burn, okay? We have the air coming from the, outer, from the outside, and the air by itself also cannot burn. And so, um, fuel and air, they come together at some point, let's say, where they are, for infinitely fast chemistry, they would be instantaneously consumed. So there's one spot here where fuel and air are zero. This is exactly where all the heat release happens. And on this side of the flame, there's no fuel because the fuel instantaneously is consumed uh, with oxygen. And on the other side, there's no oxygen, okay? And that, that is for the assumption of infinitely fast, uh, irreversible chemistry, which we call the Burke schumann limit. Now, in reality, maybe things are a little different, but if I make the flow velocity here really small, which means the um, uh, flow time scales are very, very long, that means maybe that the chemical time scales are very fast compared to the flow time scales, and then we say it's, it's close to the limit of being infinitely fast, okay? So when we say, by the way, when we say something is fast and slow, what does that mean anyways? What is slow and what's fast? So, um, uh, well, you can imagine a lot of things where a certain velocity, one meter per second, uh, is slow uh, and is fast. So if I have, for example, an ant, that runs around at one meter per second, you would say, wow, look at this end. I mean, this is really fast. But uh, if you have a car on the freeway going one meter per second, you would say, well, this is really slow. I mean, go, go ahead, right? So fast and slow means something only in comparison with something else, okay? So comparison to something else means we always need to compare two different things. So when I say fast chemistry, I mean compared with the fluid dynamic time scales, okay? Slow chemistry compared with fluid dynamic time scales. So I can make the chemistry fast without changing the chemistry, right? That's, fun. That's interesting. Uh, I can make the chemistry fast by not changing the chemistry at all, by changing the fluid dynamic time scales, okay? So in this case now, fluid dynamic time scales are very slow, so the chemistry is fast. If I crank this up, then the fluid dynamic time scales become shorter, and then, well, if I have uh, this other, I uh, have another burner where the flame lifts off and it blows out, okay? That's then the limit where the chemistry is really too slow to keep up with the fluid dynamic time scales. Um, another way of doing this would be to hold the finger in here, you know, like with a garden hose, you hold the finger inside and the flow velocities get larger. I won't do this now. So. So, um, this here is an example, injection. So when we talk, we started talking about premix flames, we had a few examples for where premix flames are being technically used. This is a diesel injector. This is actually an, an old video. It's not even a video. These are many different experiments at different times after start of injection where we, uh, we put these together. So you see injection starts. Uh, the dark stuff here is the liquid fuel. The lighter stuff here, that's the vapor phase where the fuel is evaporated already, and then at some point you see that it ignites. Here you see that you get uh, um, uh, uh, Schlieren shadows that, that show you that this is a high temperature, low density region. So this is a diesel injector, and you see here one jet uh, going to this side, and you see these other jets going, the, I think it's a three-hole injector, and they go uh, in different directions. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's uh, high pressure, high temperature uh, conditions. 
This here actually is um, uh, this, uh, this is um, a different nozzle, but this I took this myself uh, from just uh, you know using here my other uh, standard nozzle, nozzle I use in class. The other nozzle I use in class, um, it, it has a, a piece that's attached here on top. This is just for your entertainment now. So, here, yeah, this is why I don't use this very much anymore. This thing here, this, it can take this off. And um, I use this to show, ah, here's, here's my way to, uh, that I always do this, I forgot this now. I'll show you how I changed the fluid mechanic time scale. Okay, now chemistry is fast again, and um, fluid mechanics time scales are very slow, but I can increase these by shaking this thing around. And if I make the fluid mechanic time scale shorter, 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 at some point, they will be so short, chemistry cannot keep up again, okay? So what you do when you blow out the candle is you make the dump color number small, right? That, that, that's exactly the dump color number. It's the ratio of these two different time scales. You blow on the candle, you make the chemistry fast, uh, slow, not by making the chemistry slow, but by make, making fluid mechanic time scales fast. So this nozzle here, I used to do this in class. So I shake this thing around. This thing comes flying off uh, into a window. Uh, I didn't, I, I'm glad I didn't kill a student with this. But uh, anyway, so I don't use that um, that much anymore. OK, the other, uh, so, so this is the example. An, an interesting, good example for, um, of non premix combustion is a candle flame. So when you're having a nice dinner, uh, you know, romantic uh, candle, and uh, the, you know, this is what happens. You have the um, uh, candle uh, is is this wax paraffin is a hydrocarbon. You have the flame uh, by uh, radiation. You heat up this wax. It will um, melt, and then you have this wick. And it's, uh, you know, by capillary force, it goes in the wick. It goes up, and where it's further heated, where it evaporates, and um, it comes out as a fuel stream. And then the fuel stream, you know, mixes with air, just like, uh, just like this thing. Uh, and and um, uh, paraffin reacts with the oxygen. You get these very rich regions here. The orange color I mentioned before, that's uh, soot. Uh, is not good, but for the candle flame, it's very nice because, you know, it glows and it, orange looks nice. Orange good here at Princeton also. Uh, looks nice. And um, uh, if, but if the, you know, um, so, and the soot, uh, because I, I mentioned this to you, the, you have in the center, you have the rich parts where you form soot, but around it, there's a reaction zone. That reaction zone, if you look very closely, you see this blue reaction zone but it's very hard to see. But um, when the soot gets in the reaction zone, it oxidizes, it goes away. But again, this oxidation happens with a time scale. And that time scale um, is different from the oxidation of the fuel. Uh, that time scale, if you make that time scale too short um, by, for example, doing the same thing I just did, then you see the soot coming out, okay? It, it has no time. To, um, to oxidize. So I shake this thing around. Before it goes out, actually, you see the soot coming out because the, that oxidation apparently has a longer time scale than the, um, oxi you know, than just the fuel oxidation. Um, the other thing you can do when you have a candle, you just stick a spoon inside or a knife inside, which then cools the flame. It extinguishes locally, and where you extinguish the flame locally, soot will come out. So if you stick a knife in the candle flame, then you get a lot of soot. So next time you have a romantic dinner, um, try to explain this to your partner. <laughs> uh, my wife loves this when I do this. OK, anyway, so this just shows the same thing here. Uh, you have a rich region, and then there's always this stoichiometric region somewhere around. And stoichiometric uh, turns out this is where fuel and air basically are consumed. So at stoichiometric, uh, fuel and air mass fraction are very, very small. Uh, the, the, the fact that they're consumed here 
actually keeps a gradient up um, towards the oxygen side, keeps a gradient up towards the fuel side, and because you have these gradients, you have more diffusion, and things happen. But, but basically, the rate of combustion is the, is the rate of diffusion of these species into the reaction zone. So this is a premixed flame, this is a non-premixed flame, and you see here the, the big difference. Here, you have fuel and oxidizer come from the same side. Here, you have fuel from one side, and the oxidizer comes from the other side. You see here that there is an overlap of fuel and oxygen. That would show you here, in this particular case, the chemistry is not very fast, okay, because it does not go to zero. For fast chemistry, these would go to zero basically at the same point. Okay, uh, soot, soot particles, I mentioned this already. Um, time scales, again, if the, in the limit of fast chemistry, uh, we often make this assumption, mixed is burnt. Uh, as soon as fuel and air, uh, fuel and oxygen molecule come together, they react instantaneously, and as soon as they're mixed, they're burnt uh, at the same time. This um, is sometimes not a really bad assumption, uh, maybe not the greatest, but not, not a really bad assumption, but it, it's not valid for pollutants, because formation of, especially formation of pollutants, typically, um, uh, has long time scales. It, it goes very slowly. Formation of soot is very slow. You see this, um, good, I took, good thing I took this out. You see this here, or you even see it here. Just look at this thing. Um, close to the nozzle there's no soot, even though it's very rich, okay? It just takes for soot, it takes a long time. And when you look through this, you see slowly it gets brighter and brighter or more orange. Slowly you form more soot, but the oxidation is very fast, okay? The, the, there is a very, very clear separation between the, the bright and the outside. But, but it's not as fast as, the, as the, uh, uh, you know, the oxidation reaction we talked about earlier. This doesn't soot, but here, if, this, if I crank this up and I shake it around a little bit, you see soot coming out. So, um, so pollutants um, are on, on different time scales, and, and usually the assumption of fast chemistry is not good for pollutants. This is what we did earlier. We defined the mixture fraction. We said this is the stoichiometric value. It's about 0.05 for, for, or 0.55 for, um, uh, for methane, and, and for other hydrocarbons is maybe uh, slightly larger, but, but it's always less than 0.1. Um, and we said the mixture fraction and um, uh, equivalence ratio, they can be converted into each other. So for pure fuel, uh, equivalence ratio is zero. P uh, pure oxidizer is zero. For fuel, uh, equivalence ratio is infinity. The mixture fraction is defined to be zero in the oxidizer and one in the fuel. Okay? Just, yeah. Yes, it will always be uh, between zero and one. Also, Bilger's mixture fraction, because it takes also carbon in these streams into account, at least you can write it that way, uh, it will always be between zero and one. That's actually, uh, that's a good question, and one should not confuse this. Um, we define, we always say we have... Um, yeah, what was the question? Um, the question was, what if I have carbon in the... Uh, oxidizer stream. Uh, for example, because of EGR. Uh, I could have CO2, uh, you know, in the air, and, and do we then have to normalize it back to zero and one, or is it not zero and one then in these limits? And, and the answer is, yes, it is normalized. Um, this has to be taken into account. Just remember, uh, the mixture fraction is defined in a way that you have two reservoirs. One, we call one the oxidizer, one the fuel, but it doesn't have to be the case. It's just two different uh, reservoirs, and they mix. And the mixture fraction is zero and one, and one and the other. And we could, we could uh, switch this, doesn't matter. And the value of the mixture fraction then tells you how much mass locally comes from reservoir number one and reservoir number two. That's it. So that's why it should always be defined to be zero and one, no matter how your streams look like. Okay, so, so for example, they could be both or close, very close to stoichiometric, 
One is, um, has a equivalence ratio of 0.98 and the other one is 1.02. You could still have a mixer fraction that describes this mixing, even though um, that would now lead to a premixed flame, which is different from a diffusion flame. Okay, so there are simple experiments that we use to study uh, premixed, uh, non premixed flames. Um, the um, typical experiment here is a counterflow burner. Uh, I have a nozzle here on top, a nozzle on the bottom. The, um, uh, the one has maybe the oxidizer, one, one brings in the fuel. We form a stagnation plane and there's a flame here that's typically uh, on, the, on the oxidizer side and um, that is then a diffusion flame where you have the fuel come from here and the oxidizer come from there. This is, a, this is a burner that we have in our lab. You see it's quite complicated here. Uh, it has these contoured nozzles to make sure the flow is, is very clean. One thing that's very interesting, uh, very important for these burners is that the uh, velocity profile here is a, is a top hat profile. Uh, if, you have a, if here you have a velocity profile uh, and not, not just a flat velocity profile, then um, what we'll do next, uh, the, the, tr the transformation to a 1D system that wouldn't work anymore. So there's a, the people usually sp who run these burners, they usually spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the um, uh, velocity profile at the exit is flat, okay? That's, that's, that's very important. Okay, so the equations then that describe the system, uh, yesterday we had equations uh, that were just strictly 1D. Now we can uh, write these equations as a, a 2D axisymmetric system, okay? So this is the, and, and steady state, so this is the continuity equation where V and U here are the velocities and then X here is basically the radius and um, Y, this should be a Y here, Y is the coordinate that goes from one nozzle to the other. So you see the coordinate system here. Y goes from one nozzle to the other. Uh, X is the radius. And um, the reason why this is chosen like this, uh, usually, usually people choose uh, X to be the main flow direction. Uh, and here it looks like we choose Y as the main flow direction. The reason is this is very much like a boundary layer flow. And in a boundary layer, Y is always the coordinate, um, uh, crosswise coordinate. So, so this is the main flow and this is the crosswise coordinate. So the uh, momentum equation here, this is the momentum in X direction. The other one turns out is not needed and is the energy equation. And um, uh, so except for the fact that you have this one divided by X, X here, which comes from the cylindrical coordinate system, uh, you know, these are just the standard equations. Now we want to do a similarity, we want to develop a similarity solution, which means we make, we make similarity assumptions. The first one here is that uh, we have a similarity assumption for the velocity. We say the velocity should be a function of x and y, okay? But it should be a function of x and y in the form that it's linear with x, it's linear increasing in x direction and uh, times a function of y. So these should be separated, these, um, these dependencies. And then the second one is we make a similarity solution here for the pressure, which says the pressure is equal to, you know, some background pressure, thermodynamic pressure, plus a term that expresses X dependence plus a term that expresses Y dependence. So the main point here in this similarity assumption is that the X and Y dependence, they're separated. So, uh, and uh, you, here we just say P times X squared because it, 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 later on it will come out nicely if you make that assumption. But, but really the assumption here, the pressure is a function of X plus a function, function of Y. That's the, that's the assumption. And then uh, we assume the mass friction and temperature have no radial dependence, uh, let's say close to the center line. Or we would say, look, the flame looks like this and the temperature and species they have no, they, they're the same uh, or they have no dependence in this, in this radial direction. Okay, if we do that, we can introduce that in the governing equation and then uh, this is what you get. So we have a um, continuity equation here. Uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, this here is actually then the uh, equation for the velocity 
uh, in, in x direction, and this is the temperature equation. And so we have three equations, this first order equation and two second order equations, and they have boundary condition. Um, boundary conditions here are the, the nozzle velocities, the, um, uh, this pressure, this uh, velocity gradient here uh, at the nozzles, and also the temperatures. Um, okay, so, so you see this is a second order equation. I have two boundary conditions. Uh, this is a second order equation. I have two boundary conditions. And here comes the problem again. This is a first order equation, but I have two boundary conditions. So that means, what does that mean again? It should be an eigenvalue problem. There's, there's an eigenvalue. There must be a parameter in the problem that, um, that uh, needs to be determined to satisfy the last boundary condition. This is value P prime here uh, that came here from the, uh, from the pressure assumption. So um, I could do this differently. I could also say I fixed the strain rate. We'll see this later. We can also fix the strain, or we could fix this parameter, and then uh, the velocity in the second nozzle is computed. Then it wouldn't be an eigenvalue problem. Okay, that would just be a boundary value problem. So if I, f if I fix this parameter, say this is 500 or whatever, then I, have, I specify this boundary condition for V, and the second one is computed from the equation. Okay, that's, that would be the other option. Um, this, so, so, but this is a set of equations that one can solve. You know, if you use this Flame Master code, uh, there's one configuration that, uh, that, um, that you can use. This can be used now to look at um, an experiment. The experiment I showed you, it has a certain nozzle distance and, you know, velocities at the nozzle, and they can be uh, specified here, and then one can do a simulation for that. Uh, on the other hand, um, there is another way to, to derive these equations by having different boundary conditions. If you don't, uh, and that's, that's sometimes uh, interesting for analysis. Um, here, we don't assume that we have two nozzles. We assume the flow comes from infinity, okay? The flow comes from in, you know, plus infinity and minus infinity. At infinity, uh, we have potential flow. And then at some point, you have a, a stagnation plane and you have a flame that burns. Everything's infinitely large. So that, that is good for um, analysis. And, and that is actually controlled by a strain rate. The strain rate then is the velocity gradient in radial direction at infinity. So if, um, if we say the flow comes from infinity, then um, this would be the stagnation plane. Then the streamlines kind of look like this. And this, the same from the bottom. And then here you have, um, at infinity, you have a velocity gradient in this direction. And that's the, what we call the strain rate. So um, then, if, uh, for this configuration, then we can directly define similarity coordinates. So this is similarity coordinate. You see this non-dimensional. It's a, it's a density weighted coordinate here, but it, it relates um, y and um, uh, y here to this uh, similar, similarity coordinate eta. Then we can uh, introduce stream functions. Uh, you have seen, if you have uh, looked at boundary layer theory, you have seen the same thing here a uh, hundred times. A uh, stream function is introduced to uh, satisfy the, uh, automatically satisfy the continuity equation. So if I define um, the, this, the similarity function, this uh, stream function f in this way, uh, as function of u in this way, and um, as function of v in this way, if I plug these definitions then into the uh, continuity equation, it's automatically satisfied. So I don't need to worry about continuity equation. Um, uh, and you must say, now, hmm, uh, I have three equations, and I have only two equations. There must, be, there must be a catch somehow. I mean, you don't get a free lunch. So uh, you see you have a higher derivative here. Instead of u, you have now f prime. So it's a higher derivative. So you exchange an equation for an additional uh, derivative. So uh, this is a parameter that's defined. If we uh, introduce these assumptions in the governing equations, this is what you get. This is the uh, this is equation here for F, equation for mass fraction, equation for temperature, and these also 
uh, uh, can be solved with certain boundary. If you use basically um, a reasonable boundary condition at infinity, then you can just easily, from the definition, you can derive uh, these boundary conditions. So um, once the solution for f is obtained, you see this now is a, um, is a, a third order equation. Uh, you see here, I have a second derivative and derivative of this. So this is a third derivative. That's the, that's the catch I was mentioning uh, on the previous slide. So this has to be integrated three times rather than two times. But anyways, uh, these are the boundary conditions. And um, this system now can also be solved. Now, um, these are here uh, different temperature profiles that you get from solving these. This here is counter flow diffusion flame. Um, uh, as function, the, the temperature as function of y. The, the, um, this here is actually, uh, there's no nozzles, it goes to infinity, um, but you have a certain strain rate, and the um, higher the strain, so low strain rate, C gives you a very wide um, profile, and a very high strain rate gives you, these actually are switched. Um, this here is um, strain rate of one, and this here must be the highest strain rate, 594. Y594, that's very close to extinction. You see, if I increase the strain rate, then the profiles become more narrow, and at the same time, um, they become more narrow, and at the same time, the, the temperature, maximum temperature goes down. And uh, you see, at some point here, if I go higher than this, then this flame will just extinguish. If I, so, you s if I plot the exact same thing as function of mixer fraction, then you see uh, now, of course, everything has to vary between 0 and 1. And what you see here then is that the structure of these three flames here looks very similar, but again, the maximum temperature, um, the maximum temperature goes down if the strain is increased. Also here, these, the colors should be switched. Okay, why is that? Um, at, um, at very low strain rate, I have uh, fuel and oxygen they diffuse into the reaction zone. And then it takes a certain reaction time to convert these to products. Converting to products means I have heat release also. Temperature goes up. If the chemistry is infinitely fast, then this will give me the adiabatic flame temperature. Okay? But now if I increase the strain rate, then the residence time becomes shorter and shorter. If the residence time is shorter, maybe I cannot convert all my fuel and air that I have in this point to, um, uh, uh, to, you know, to products. And then because of this, the temperature is not quite as high. Okay? I have heat losses which are faster than my conversion. And if I uh, you know, increase this even more uh, to this, you see here then the gradients become larger, the, f the, the uh, diffusive time scale gets shorter and shorter, and the chemistry cannot keep up uh, with this short, um, with a short um, uh, uh, flow time scale anymore, which is why the temperature goes down, down, down. Ultimately, I get to the point where radical consumption is faster than radical production, and the thing will, uh, will just extinguish. So, if I look at the temperature then as function of the strain rate, so this is low strain rate, higher and higher strain rate. Low, higher, higher strain rate. You see the temperature goes down up to a point where I get extinction, uh, where I get extinction here, okay? And that, is, and that is the point then where I would say the Dunkler number here is uh, low enough that um, extinction can happen. This way, Dunkler number um, gets larger. Uh, chemistry is fast and I reach, I go close here to uh, the uh, adiabatic flame temperature. Okay, so uh, if we want to look at the, the flame structure then, um, we have made the assumption maybe that chemistry is uh, infinitely fast, which is typically not the case, but we can say very often the chemistry is quite fast, especially when you look at um, combustion devices. If the chemistry becomes too slow, then the flame will extinguish. So if, if I ask you to design a combustion device, 
you will design a combustion device where the chemistry is fast, okay? Because uh, if you don't do that, it just doesn't burn. And you think, mm, what would, you know, I, something is wrong here. So, um, which is why that assumption is, is often uh, quite good. Um, it's not good when, when the characteristic timescales of the flow become too short or are of the same order of magnitude as the chemical timescales. That is, for example, the case for, um, for liftoff and extinction, uh, as I just mentioned. And also for pollutants, that's not the case. These are all things that uh, we said before. So what we want to do is now, we want to, because, uh, because you see here that if I look at the diffusion flame in physical space, um, uh, you know, different things happen, happen uh, quite differently for, for different uh, flow conditions. If I look at this in, in terms of mixture fraction, it all looks very similar. So maybe looking at this in terms of mixture fraction is not a bad idea. So that, that's what we want to do. We want to express the equations as function of mixture fraction. And then we can do also do an asymptotic approximation for relatively fast, not infinitely fast chemistry, but for relatively fast chemistry. And that leads then to one-dimensional equations. So we start out by assuming um, a unity Lewis number for all species. And so then this is the um, this is the mass fraction equation, and this is the mixture fraction equation. We can just write this down. Mixture fraction equation has no chemical source term. That's, that's important because the mixture fraction, like the equivalence ratio, uh, it, is, it, it, it doesn't increase or decrease just because of chemical reactions. Uh, and this is the temperature equation. We assume uh, here for this equation, we assume um, uh, low Mach number limit. Um, the, we neglect here the, the pressure term. Uh, in the, um, uh, the low Mach number limit, which, which actually does that. We don't need to neglect the pressure term, but very often we do that. Um, uh, so exactly, pressure, temporal pressure change is retained, but this is not an acoustic pressure. This is just a thermodynamic pressure, the pressure that you would find in the uh, gas equ in the equation of state. Okay, so... Uh, then um, we identify here, we said we have a f um, fuel comes from one side here and the oxidizer from another side. And in between, I have a stoichiometric surface. And the stoichiometric surface, that's where all the action is. And we want to say we um, want to attach, um, attach a coordinate system to that surface. So the way we do this is we say the x1 coordinate locally the x1 coordinate should be normal to, the, to that uh, surface of stoichiometric condition. And then um, we have uh, the other two coordinates. They are then tangential, x2 and x3. They are tangential to that surface. And then we want to do a transformation in a new coordinate system where basically just the x1 coordinate is stretched. The x1 coordinate does not change its direction. Uh, it is replaced, so it's a physical coordinate, a physical space, and it's replaced by mixture fraction, okay? Because um, the, if the x1, um, x1 direction is normal to the surface of stoichiometric mixture, then the, it goes in the direction of the gradient of mixture fraction, okay? Means in this direction it gets smaller, and in this direction it gets larger. So I have a unique, I can have a locally close to that flame, I have a unique relation between the two, and I can, they go in the same direction, and I can just express one as function of the other. And then we have the um, other two directions, x2 and x3, and we just say, we call these now in our new coordinate system, we call these z2 and z3, uh, but they should be the same. And also the time, we give it a new name in the new coordinate system, and the, um, uh, but, it's, but it's the same. Okay, so the only thing that's changed is x1 is replaced by uh, mixer fraction. Then we get uh, transformation rules. The transformation rules are shown here. So you get, um, so if you have a transformation, we have a transformation now, um, t, x1, x2, x3 goes to tau, um, sorry, z1, z2, 
and Z3. And then this means if I want to express D by D tau, uh, D by DT, I want to replace this, then this will be D tau by DT, D by D tau, plus D, uh, B, D Z1 by DT, D by D Z1, and plus, and so on, okay? Z2, Z3. Tau and T are the same, so this is equal to 1. Um, Z1 is the same as X1, but X1 and T are independent coordinate systems in the original uh, uh, coordinate system, so this is 0, okay? So, um, um, uh, well, sorry. So the, um, this is not Z1, this is DZ by DT. DZ by DT, Z of course changes. Z is, Z is different from X1, okay? So, let me write this again. So DZ by DT, D by DZ, plus DZ2 by DT, D by DZ2, and then plus DZ3 by DT, D by DZ3. Okay, so this is equal to 1. Uh, Z is, is, um, is not independent of T, so this just remains. And, but Z2, that's the same as X2, and X2 is independent of T. So this goes away, and this goes away for the same reason, okay? So this is what we uh, have up here. Uh, in your hand, in your notes, I did this, uh, in your notes this is wrong, and I corrected it yesterday, but I didn't do a good job at correcting it somehow. So uh, there's a D missing here in the numerator. So, um, okay, this, this term here was right. So I do the same thing for, uh, for the other variables here, so this was for t, I do the same thing for x1, x2, x3, and I get these transformation rules here. d by dx1 is dz by dx1, d by dz, and then um, this here for x alpha here means 2 and 3. So if I, if I plug this in the equation, this, I get this very lengthy equation here, and the, um, uh, I can do the same thing also for the uh, for the, the mass fractions, and, you know, it's similar on the left-hand side. Uh, it's just different on the right-hand side. Turns out there is this term here. This term is the, uh, is the most important term. Um, uh, this is the, um, uh, basically, is the diffusion uh, term here for the temperature uh, in the direction of mixture fraction. Uh, that should be the most Im uh, important term. Because if you look at this candle flame here, then you see that um, we said we have a new coordinate system, which is normal to the, the surface of stoichiometric mixture. The surface of stoichiometric mixture is roughly the edge here of this, of this luminous flame, okay? So if you look at the temperature, uh, if I go along this surface, you see the temperature, I mean, you just imagine how the temperature should be. The temperature doesn't change very much because the conditions along the surface, they don't change very much. But if I go across this, if I go in the direction of Z, then you see you get very strong changes, okay? So that's why um, this, this the, all the derivatives in these directions, x2, x3, they are small compared to, to derivatives in the x direction. Uh, and in this equation, they can all be neglected, and then we end up uh, with this equation here, okay? So we have a time-dependent term, and then we have this term here, which is the diffusion term in this direction, with this coefficient here, whatever that means. And then on the right-hand side, we have the terms as before. Okay, everything else has been neglected. So these are uh, then what we call the flamelet equations that, um, that uh, gives you, so you can solve this here, um, it, and it gives you the temperature as function of time and function of mixture fraction. Okay, 
Um, now the only thing we don't know is the uh, is is what what this is. Okay. Now this what I just said in words uh, that the, all these terms can be neglected. Uh, really, you would have to do an asymptotic, rigorous asymptotic analysis to do this here in the limit of uh, large uh, Dunkler numbers. And if you do that, you you get the uh, you get the same thing. But at the end of the day, these are the equations that are left. And this prefactor here I just showed you, we call this the scalar dissipation rate. Okay? We call this chi scalar dissipation rate. And that is essentially, so you see, this equation uh, gives you the temperature as a function of mixture fraction, and it doesn't know anything about the flow field. Okay? The only way where the flow field comes in is by this term, because so this is the temperature as function of mixture fraction. This is the mixture fraction in space. Okay? So if mixture fraction space has a very strong gradient, then in space the temperature also has a very strong gradient. Okay? So this is what this says. Uh, and then the diffusion term here is very large. If the mixture fraction in space has a very small gradient, then also the temperature in, in physical space will have a small gradient. And, uh, and then it turns out this term is small because, because the prefactor is small, okay? So that's, uh, that's what this does. We can also formally associate this with um, a dissipation rate. Uh, when we talk about turbulent combustion, we'll see that this term really, um, why this term is called a dissipation rate. But you can think of this term as the rate of molecular mixing. This is the rate of molecular mixing between fuel and air, okay? So that's, kind of, that's how you can think about it. So if the rate of molecular mixing is very large, then this term becomes small. Rate of molecular mixing is very small, then this term um, uh, becomes small. Okay, has the uh, dimension of inverse of a second, one divided by second. So it's an inverse of a characteristic uh, diffusion time or mixing time. Okay. Okay, so... Um, uh, so, so this has, represents all the effect of here of uh, convection and diffusion uh, in this equation. In the limit where this goes to zero, um, we get the equations for a homogeneous reactor. Not quite. There's a very small difference. If you look at this and you just uh, chi equal to zero and you make these terms go to zero, then uh, this is dy d T is equal to m dot. You see, I replaced the tau again with T uh, just to stick with the notation of, of T. But um, this looks like a homogeneous reactor equation, but there's a subtle difference. What's the subtle difference? So the subtle difference is the coordinate system. Dy by dt normally would say, and, and that is also why, so if I said earlier, Z2 is the same as X2, why did I give it a different name? If, if tau is the same as T, why did I give it a different name? Because um, a, a, a variable in a coordinate system always makes sense only in its own coordinate system, only in, the, uh, in its own coordinate system. So for example, um, we have the um, t, so if you have a partial derivative, d by d tau, what does it mean? It means the rate of change with respect to in time at a given x1, x2, x3, okay? Because t and this is one coordinate system, so partial derivative always means this is fixed. So there's one fixed point in time. I, I would measure this by standing here and measure whatever temperature maybe at this point, a little later, and then I evaluate the derivative, okay? But, but the other one, d by d tau, that is evaluated at a given z, z2, z3. Given z means it's the mixture fraction doesn't change. If I have a flame contour here, which, which travels here through space, this means I keep sitting here on this 
on this flame. I travel with the flame in time, okay? So maybe it's not too important, but it's always uh, important to remember that these partial derivatives always belong to a coordinate system. This one coordinate system is flying through space, the other coordinate system is not. Okay, so, um, right, so if I solve these equations then, then this is how this looks like, and you see here also, small mistake, the error should go in the other direction. High dissipation rate gives you low temperature. And you see um, this low dissipation rate, high dissipation rate, even higher dissipation rate. These are methane air flames, as uh, we just saw earlier. These here would be the same methane air flames. Oh, no, these are propane air flames. This is basically um, similar to what I showed you earlier. This is small and is 100 and 950. Um, uh, and here now this low dissipation rate or strain rate, higher strain rate, higher strain rate. So higher strain rate also means higher gradients, which means higher dissipation rate. Okay, arrow in this direction. Okay? Um, okay, so, so if I solve this equation then, if I solve these, um, let's forget about um, the unsteady term here and look for steady state solution of this equation, okay? Then of this set of equations. Then you see the only parameter I have is the dissipation rate and I can solve these equations for different values of the dissipation rate. And this curve here shows the steady solutions to this set of equations and uh, it's shown here as a function of the dissipation rate to the minus one. Why dissipation rate to the minus one? Why not dissipation rate? Um, why do I show this here as function of dissipation rate to the minus one? Why don't I show this as dissipation rate as function of dissipation rate? Does it reflect the residence time? Yeah, because that is the residence time and you can say the Dumbkuller number we said is equal to the residence time or flow time scale divided by a chemical time scale. So that would then be equal to 1 divided by Tc times this chi stoichiometric, okay? So, so chi to the minus 1, that is something like a Dumbkuller number, okay? If I would make this non-dimensional. Uh, that would be something, so this is something like a Dumbkiller number, only it, it has dimensions. Okay, so, but if I increase the, the, uh, the if I decrease the Dumbkiller number or increase the dissipation rate, the temperature goes down, that's what we said earlier, and then I get, at some point I get extinction. Now what's interesting is, um, so this here is not burning, okay? So if I, now I'm, I'm not burning here, I decrease the dissipation rate again, at some point it will ignite, okay? Uh, and what's, what's also interesting is that there are certain dissipation rates where I have three different solutions, okay? I have a burning solution, I have a not burning solution, and I have a solution in between, okay? We'll turn out the, um, this solution here, the intermediate solution is unstable, it's a steady state solution, but it's unstable, it's just like you know, I put this uh, laser pointer here, I, I have it standing here on the table, and if I do it just right, then, then it will stay there. So it is a solution to the system of motion, to the equation of motion, but it's unstable. I mean, I, I, I can't do this. I tried this many, many times. It, it never worked. So it's the same here. This is, this is not stable. It's a solution, but it's not stable. But that's interesting. I mean, I get two different solutions. Did you have thought, um, who would have thought that you get two different solutions or who can explain the two different solutions? It's a trivial question, actually. So let's try this again. I g first go to the burning solution here, okay? This is diffusion flame. I have a certain dissipation rate and maybe I'm here. Now what I could do is I increase the dissipation rate up to the point where this will extinguish and then we'll go down here and then I decrease the dissipation rate again and then I should end up here, 
Okay? Let's try this. How do I increase the dissipation rate? By increasing the strain. I can do this by just blowing at this thing. <laughs> okay? Now, I still have the same flow here. Everything is the same. Mixture fraction field is very, very similar. Um, but I went, I blowing, I went over here. It extinguishes. I stop blowing. It goes back to this. And now we're on this lower branch. Okay? How do I get to the upper branch? I would have to in decrease the dissipation rate so much it auto ignites. Uh, I would have to decrease the dissipation rate uh, to 10 to the minus 20 or whatever, which is not realizable. So at, at ambient conditions, I can't reach that point. Okay? But I could artificially bring this up here by just using this. I don't do this now. I turn this off. And um, before I lose uh, the rest of my hair uh, to this flame here. So, uh, let's see. Oh, we have a few more minutes. So, so but that's, that's interesting. What is this? Why do we get three solutions? Because of the nonlinearities. We said this before. We are looking at a very highly nonlinear process. If things are nonlinear, I get two solutions. Y is equal to X squared. Um, what is X? Uh, y is equal to X squared. Um, what is X? It's the square root of... Um, is plus or minus the square root of y, right? So any time something is nonlinear, I get two solutions. Uh, I, get, I might get multiple solutions, okay? So here we do have multiple solutions, and again, this one here is not stable. Uh, this is what we call the S-shaped curve, S-shaped curve, and um, uh, this, again, I mean, this... Uh, uh, um, can be computed here for these, um, uh, for the counterflow diffusion flame, or also for these uh, flimmed equations. Uh, the, the equation now, as it was derived, is valid only for, I mean, we derived it only for a small region around stoichiometric, really where all the action is, but the rest is just mixing anyways. Uh, if I go, you know, more to the lean side, more to the rich side, uh, it's all just mixing anyways. And then sometimes the, this is actually an exact solution. For example, for the counterflow diffusion flame I mentioned earlier, this is an exact solution if, if the, the dissipation rate has to be known, but, but then this is an exact solution. This is interesting because it shows, uh, this shows data here from uh, Rob Barlow at Sandia. It shows data um, in turbulent diffusion flames. And so what he did was he measured uh, temperature and different species. So this is temperature, this O2, methane, and so on, at three different uh, uh, positions. This close to the nozzle, this downstream, this even further downstream. And then um, he evaluated here the, um, uh, the conditional means as function of mixture fraction. Okay, so you see the temperature. That looks very similar to what we saw earlier, and if we uh, compare it, this here is a, um, a large eddy results from a large eddy simulation that we have done, the solid lines um, for, or the, the, the solid and the dashed lines, a large eddy simulation that we did for this case. And you see, uh, using a, a flamelet type model, which is based on these equations, how this is based on these equations, uh, I'll tell you later. But, but the, the one thing I find interesting here, if you just look at this equation, and you think, okay, let's assume that this is valid now for, to describe this, you know, this flame structure of this non-premixed flame. Meaning, the chemistry has to be relatively fast. That's what, that was our only assumption, is the chemistry is relatively fast. The gradients um, across the flame are much higher than along the flame. That's what, that was the only assumption. So let's say we do this, then you see um, that you have a, the profile here has a certain curvature. So this here, dy, d2y, dz squared, that is the curvature in a, in a plot like this, okay? So here, for example, um, we, we're looking at the mass fractions. Um, here, for example, CO2, this is a negative curvature, okay? This here is a positive curvature. The curvature, the uh, dissipation rate is always positive. This has a minus, 
So negative curvature and a minus gives you a positive source term. So from just looking at this plot, I can tell you where the source term is non-zero or is it where it's zero. I can tell you if the source term is positive, negative, all of this, okay? That's what this equation here says. So negative curvature, positive curvature is a sink term, gives you negative chemical source term. So this is the region where CO is consumed. This is uh, negative curvature, meaning positive source term. This is the region where CO2 is formed. Look at this region here, curvature zero. This region, curvature zero. Curvature zero, or here, O2, curvature zero. Zero curvature means zero source term, okay? I can tell you, just from looking at this, I can tell you exactly where the source term is positive, negative, and where it's zero. And you see that uh, most of this actually is um, chemically inert. You see all of this chemically inert. Uh, all of this here on this side chemically inert. And the only region where I have a source term is this region here around stoichiometric. Okay? And the other thing you see is here where water is formed, where H2 is consumed, where the H2 is formed, uh, and all of this. So, so that is one nice consequence of these Fleming equations that uh, if you have data like this, you can easily interpret the, the data. So is it break time again? Or? Yeah, I think it's break time again. So, so let's stop here, and I'll see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>